Hey, welcome to the 190th episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by patrons Paul Hillbank, Katie Harbin, and Ant Fallon. I'm Matt Enlow. And I'm Warren Kaplan, and today it's just Matt and me, and we're talking shorts. Everything you wanted to know, and probably a lot of stuff you didn't want to know about what we think about shorts. We're going to talk about why you would make a short, what we think makes a good and bad short, and then we'll even get into a little bit of what to do with your short once you've made it, and how important it is you know, to go to festivals and to show it to people and all that stuff. Uh, before we get into the main conversation, I did want to bring up, um, we are looking for a new producer. Our dear friend Madeline has gotten a little too busy to take on the show the way she used to, and so we've got a new opportunity for a person who wants to learn about the ins and outs of producing a podcast and also working with me on social media and the distribution of the show in general. So like, I think it's a really good opportunity for someone who wants a little bit more access to the people that we talk to and the kind of behind-the-scenes extra perks of making a show like this and also wants real tangible boots on the ground experience on producing creating publishing marketing a show on a weekly basis all of these skills and all of the different resources that we've accumulated over the last four years are all direct one-to-one lessons that you can implement when you are crowdfunding or releasing your first short film or your first feature so if you're a person who has a little bit of time on their hands and wants to reach out, you can give us a, an email, drop us an email with the subject line producer to just shoot it pod at gmail.com. Yeah. And you can live anywhere, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is a, a, a job that you can definitely do remotely if you would like. Yeah. And for me, I think part of the most fun part of it is like interacting with our guests, helping us book guests, helping us figure out uh, the topics we're going to talk about. And yeah, like Matt said, just like being involved in every aspect from recording to content to the creative stuff to distributing to live events and all all the rest of the things yeah it's a real primer on all that stuff so drop us a line subject line producer just shoot pod at gmail.com and thanks madeline for all your help we'll miss you matt has made a couple shorts recently he just premiered was it the premiere in austin not technically, but it was the first time I saw it with an audience, oh, so it cool. felt like it. It was definitely your best screen, like your mo- most yeah, exciting screening. It, the most prestigious screening, we'll say. Right. And you have been consistently better about making shorts. And you also produced your wife's short that went to a bazillion festivals, and you've just kind of been in that world more recently than me. Not yeah. that... There, there is a world. I mean, a lot of the guests that we have, we watch their short films before they come on. And that's part of what gets us excited about them. So I just wanted to give the disclaimer that I myself, I've made many shorts. I've worked on many shorts. I've done every position on every film school short there ever has been. I just want everyone to take everything I say with a grain of salt because it's a lot of opinions that I have, but not a lot of my own personal work recently in today's climate to back it up. So I just, I just want sure. to put that out there. Fair enough. And I think, you know, my intention with this episode is to talk about maybe a little bit more the philosophies and and ideas that we have about short films and why you make them and what's interesting about them and all of that, which I think is different than dearth of like how to make a great short film articles out there and, you know, whole podcast devoted to that. And, you know, that's what film school practically is, you know. So it's less about how to make your your vision come to life in 25 minutes or less. And it's more about like, why would a person like us want to make one? Because I think that, you know, our listeners have a lot in common with us. And like, I noticed a difference between myself and the say student filmmakers who did really great, really exciting work that I got to spend a decent amount of time with at Austin. But we, you know, we were looking for different things and and trying to create different things. And um, there's different motivations to it basically. So um, so yeah, I think it's, it's worth talking about. Yeah. May, I would say the perspective here is your perspective is why would a working filmmaker make a short film? Right. And my perspective is I want to make a short film, but I keep getting distracted by like paid work. And it also obviously like everyone else have this fear of like making a short that just doesn't do anything for me. 
Well, look, let's jump in then, right? Because I think their first topic is why make a short film. And I, I think that without getting too maximy, and then we'll get into like the mild soft core of, uh, of, of short filmmaking later. There's a, a, a lot of wisdom, or at least I found a lot of success in keeping the shorts really simple. And so they don't get too out of hand and too overly ambitious. If you can find like something that feels like you can shoot it in a day or two and you can try out a different thing or make something cool or weird, that really helps you find the way to make the time and execute, basically. And the money, frankly, you know? Yeah. And the, and the favors, all those resources that it takes to make a film. I think if you're keeping things simple and light and fun, make it achievable. I saw a lot of really great student films over the last few years, but you can tell that they spent months on them. Right, you know, like an entire were, semester. An entire, well, I, oftentimes it's a year, you know, because sometimes they'll do the thing where they'll it's like their thesis. develop it. Yeah, it's their thesis. So they spend like a, a semester developing it, and then they spend a sp- semester shooting it, and then like a ton of time in post and like, there's sometimes even a little bit of an incentive to drag your feet on them, depending on how uh, anxious you are about paying your student loans back, right? Because you don't technically graduate until you're, you've turned in your thesis. So sometimes people will really like take their time on that. Right. I think I mentioned this before, but I worked on this like $100,000 USC thesis film. I was a dolly grip on it. And the director, I don't think he ended up doing anything worthwhile and the dp ended up shooting like ncis or something <laughs> like yeah yeah, yeah. like the if next you're year a dp at, at a fancy film school i think that you can be drowning in opportunity right so knowing that even if you make a hundred thousand dollar short film it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to make your your directing career what are some what are some reasons you would make a short film and i would even like to hear like you specifically matt as a as a working director someone that gets paid to direct why would you go out of your way to make your own short film sure so i think there's a handful of really straightforward reasons actually when i made a gray one a year ago it was i was in a circumstance where like i was getting paid and working on things that millions of people were seeing and it was all you know very glamorous and i was working on the lot and all of that stuff but it was you know like we talk about on the show the higher up you get the less authorial voice you have in most of the things you're making. I was working on a show, I was working on commercials, I was doing a lot of different stuff. And, you know, I think that that facilitated the drive, I think, to to do a short because it was like, oh, I just want to make something that's really specifically my voice, you know. Right. And you weren't, you were kind of less worried about money. Where money was going to come from. Yeah. Or even how I was going to, say, pay back those favors because, like, I was working regularly enough that like, you know, I was throwing people work pretty frequently, you know? And also I think that when you're in these more steady gigs or, or gigs that aren't totally, you know, in line with your, your voice completely, or, you know, not that you're not proud of the work or that it's not good in some way, but I was less excited about sharing it online or telling people about it or like hitting up my contacts to be like hey check out this cool new thing i did because they've already seen me do that a bunch of times you know there's only so many times that you can say look at this you know episode six season two of a show i've already showed you the best episodes from right yeah you felt like it wasn't you or it was it it wasn't you doing anything new it was a different shade of me. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so that, I mean, that's really the really straightforward version of it. But I think that, that there's a lot to unpack there, right? Like having a sample that you're proud of and excited about to show people is a genuinely careerist move, you know? And I'm very excited. We'll get into distribution later on in the episode, but I'm very excited to be able to send out the full version of the film soon, you know, like as like a, you know, a heads up to like, development executives that it's been a minute since I've talked to and like just old friends and you know just kind of spreading the word it's nice to be able to say like hey you know this is a cool thing that I made that like did well and then also to be honest Orin you and I make comedy all the time but we don't screen it in front of audiences very frequently and so even when you see millions of people watched something you made and they commented and really liked it, it, it it's not the same as like 
listening to people laugh, you know, hearing jokes that you wrote alone in your bedroom land with an audience is gratifying. And um, sometimes it's nice to hear that. Yeah, no, for sure. It, like, obviously, it's fun to go to film festivals and wa- watch people watch your short. But I, for me, the reason I would make a short would probably not be that. Like, that probably wouldn't be in my top three reasons to make a short sure. film. I guess, you know, the other things, obviously, the thing that I put on our list of reasons to make a short film is as a proof of concept mm-hmm. for something bigger. To me, it's like, do you want... I want to sell a TV show. I want to sell a web show. I want to sell a movie. I want to show people what something looks and feels like. It would be great to make like the short film version of it. And there's some really amazing examples that we should put on our website that aren't like as old as Bottle Rocket. I mean, Thunder Road being, uh, you know, the example of Coran right now, or, you know, like uh, Bagman, which was the short that became Kin, Dan Casey wrote. Um, Right, right. Yeah, I I think that like, I would argue just as a tiny bit of pushback because I think I'm really kind of advocating for shorts as uh, their own medium and their own form. I I would argue that making a short film that's in your voice that you're proud of and is good is a proof of concept for the largest thing, which is your voice and yourself as a director. And so I think that like, Yes, it's it's a great idea if you can like take a, your masterpiece of a screenplay and slice out a scene and it becomes the whiplash short. That's like awesome. If you can pull that off, like more power to you. But I think that it's also very very easy to get bogged down in needing to first come up with the feature, write that feature, workshop that feature, get it in great shape, then go sh- shoot the short and then You know, like that's a long road. And look, if you're Damien Chazelle and you're writing a a ton of great movies and you're really well connected in Hollywood, then like, perfect. That's not a, that's not a problem. But like, for me, it was really nice to be able to like email my agent and say, Hey man, like I'm going to Austin. Yeah, no, you're right about the, yeah, the proof of concept. Like if you're, if you're making a proof of concept for a movie, then you need to have this movie script (laughs) ready. And, and I think that there's maybe there's a halfway point there as well where you can do something that's in a similar voice and you want to kind of practice and like you know you you're gonna do a zombie rom-com as your you know first feature but like you really just want to get like a zombie buddy comedy out of your system first i think that like that can still be genuinely tangibly helpful in ways that aren't just kind of like ephemeral, like, oh, it's fun to go to a film festival or whatever, you know? Yeah, for sure. I think like Chronicle has like one of the better short, it has basically just like a scene that's with different actors and we're actually in the movie mm-hmm. that they shot, oh, but, but they, as a proof of concept of what the effects will look like and the aesthetics and how you do a found footage superhero movie. Yeah. I mean, I would say that not all proof of concepts are great short films, Right. And not all short films need to be proof of concepts. Right. For them to be helpful. And look, some people can like figure out how to make it work both ways. But the path that I have taken, for better or worse, is I just want to make a short film that stands alone as a short film and as a good movie that's interesting as an excuse to work with my friends and try a new technique and get a small story out there that works as a short I want to basically just do that once a year forever yeah. while I'm doing everything else, basically. Because it's like, you know. That's kind of like the Tim Wilkheim model. Yeah, yeah, totally. One yeah, of our and- previous guests who's made these like incredible shorts that every single one is like a Vimeo staff pick. And they're all kind of simple, but complex, like simple ideas mm-hmm. with complex characters. Yeah, rich, I would say. Yeah. You know, like they're really and, and genuinely funny and show off his voice. And, you know, I don't want to speak for Tim, but like having talked to him about it, you know, I think he was directing a ton of TV, but it was all like a very specific style. And, you know, he wanted to show that he could do other things. And so it's nice to be able to like have a handy uh, proof of concept, basically, to say this is this is another thing that I do. Right. Another reason, obviously, you would make a short is just for practice. It's kind of like what you do in film school, make a bunch of short films. But I think like a couple other reasons are... One is to like kind of show what a tone, you know, that you as a filmmaker can want to convey. Like maybe you want to do comedies, but they're really dark and twisted in in a way 
that is uniquely you. And I, I think the best example of that is Ari Aster, whose website sure. I've endorsed before. But if you go to his website, ariaster.com, and you see his shorts, they're so crazy. They're really well made, but just so odd. He has one with Rachel Brosnan that, that's not at all dark. It's kind of just like a character piece. And then he has different ones that are like about pedophilia. I mean, just like the darkest, worst things in society <laughs> that there are. But he obviously, you see his movie, his first movie, Hereditary, and you're like, duh, of course he's going to get that movie based on his shorts. Like his shorts are so, are, are that movie. And then the other reason, and it's something I've been thinking about a lot, is like, if you want to attach a really good actor to your movie, you kind of need to prove to them. And by good, I mean like kind of famous. Famous, no, um, yeah, yeah, that's what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Not an amazing, act, not just talented, but kind of a known actor. You need to prove to them that you can make actors look really good and take them to places that are impressive, you know, from an acting standpoint. And I think a short film is where you can do that. Like, that's what he did with Rachel Brosnahan in that short film, which I actually think she might have written. It it also put her on the map in a way that she wasn't known before. Like, she had done House of Cards, but she hadn't been a big personality on that show. Like, she was after making that short. So, like, if I make a short, I also want it to be, like, a really good performance piece. Yeah. Like, if you were... Like you have to go sit down and have coffee with someone, right? Like the next Rachel Brosnahan, right? You have to have things to show them, you know, like a great lookbook and a great script are awesome. Yeah. And look. And a couple of good looking 30 second commercials. Sure. Yeah. Which are actually 20 seconds of content and 10 seconds of talking (laughs) about the brand. And it's nice to have digestible short things like that and to say like, oh, I I see this is like what this person does and how skilled they are and these sorts of things. But like, you know, you want to be able to like show an actor that you can do something cool and exciting and daring with them. And so, you know, for a couple thousand bucks and a weekend worth of time, that feels like a no brainer to me, you know? Right. And also, if it's bad, who cares? Yeah. You know, like it sucks. Well, unless it's, you spend 20 grand on it. Sure. Well, well, and that's why I think I'm advocating for the the more casual, lower stakes sort of short films. But what I if you want to really... prove to people you can do like action scenes or special effects sure. makeup or something, you know, really crazy, like art direction? Yeah, yeah. And like the short that I'm doing, you know, next has some kind of weirder elements for sure. But they're written with a budget in mind and... They're very specific and, you know, you can call a favor in for like a really cool VFX piece or like crazy like makeup or things like that. Like you can make that work if it's one day that the artist has to come in and do it. And maybe look, maybe you do spend a couple grand on it, but like everything else is in your apartment with a camera that you can borrow. You know, I'm not saying do it for $5. I think I think that's an interesting way to go and I think it can be really great, but I think that there's a uh there's a big difference between like, oh, I saved up 500, 1000, 2000, which is real money and and not to be taken lightly, but that's different than a 20,000, 30,000, 100,000 short. I think that you can get a ton of mileage if you're strategic about how you spend your money and the way you spend your time on a more limited budget. I guess it just depends on the project. Cause you think of like that Adi Shankar stuff, you know, another one of our previous guests, he made the Punisher short and the Power Rangers short, which clearly had, I think, you know, he spent at least $10,000 right on those. And they, it looks like, it looks like more than 10. It, they look great. And they definitely stuck out in a way that sure that put him on the map. I guess all I'm saying really is that, um, don't let money become an inhibiting factor for you that like my short which costs like a grand maybe a small enough amount of money that i don't really remember how much it cost and this was at a time when i was making money and it's a tax write-off and blah 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 you're talking about a gray one a gray one yeah was up against shorts that certainly were in six figures you know in the same block right yeah and 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 there were other shorts that were as inexpensive as ours can i ask you some production questions about a gray sure. one yeah so a gray one for those that don't know is about a couple that are married and they're going through some hardships realizing that the the wife realizes that one of her pubes is gray and that she's getting yeah. old 
yeah, hardship is maybe there. They, it's more of an existential crisis in realizing that they are aging. Right. So it's designed to be very suitable because it's about one couple in one apartment, right? Correct. So did you, um, was it SAG? It was, yeah. And how difficult slash expensive was that to do? It was easy. Yeah. Yeah. SAG, SAG has really uh, great short film agreements where you can defer payment and, you know, it's just about filling out paperwork and things. And is there a reason it had to be SAG? The caliber of talent that I wanted. I think, you know, they probably both would have maybe like done another under the table or something. Maybe. I don't know. Um, but it's just easier to do it right. Okay, cool. And then number two, did you have a producer and how important is it to have a producer that's not you? I did have a producer, my friend Jillian Jesk, who we've worked with together like many, many times. And it was it was definitely very nice because she asked a lot of the questions that I maybe wouldn't have thought to ask or, or thought through things in a way that like a producer does better than I do. But I definitely took on a much more producerial role on this as well. Yeah, I definitely, I would say, probably split duties with her. Right. So, so that it was easier for her and that she was just kind of stepping in to add her expertise and also just because that's the nature of you know, doing something like this. I guess if I was making a short, let's say I was going to put up, spend like $3,000 of my own money to make a short mm-hmm. film. Uh, one day shoot, you know, a lot of favors, mm-hmm. but some art, some things that I'm investing in, I don't know, lighting or location. Would you recommend that I get a producer or that I try to produce it myself? I would recommend that you find a producer who would benefit from a short like the one you're making. Maybe they want a little more experience in narrative. Maybe they are bored and they're good friends with you. Maybe they've been stuck in commercials for a long time and want to find a a way to get into more narrative. Maybe they want an excuse to do some networking at film festivals with you, like asking around. But, you know, certainly it was like a good friend, you know, who did it. Like, I don't think she would have done it if it wasn't that we were good friends right so you made this short a great one you went to austin film festival with it you made the other short with chrissy killed in action killed in action last year so you've seen a ton of short films in the last couple of years is that a true statement yeah we did a very good job of of watching shorts and i kind of have always been i've always loved the format i've always loved the the world of short films so i i will we've talked about how i like to just like throw you know, Vimeo staff picks up on the Apple TV and watch a bunch of those as well. Right. So yeah, I've seen a bunch. Can you tell me some of the things that you've seen in many, many shorts that bother you? Um, yeah, I would say also, I just want to preface this. Like, like we said before, there's a lot of student films at short film festivals or in short blocks. Right. And so it's unfair to compare, say someone who's still learning and has done really great work with a person who has more experience or maybe isn't under the mandates of like a specific curriculum or all that stuff. So like some of the stuff that I'm complaining about or that an audience would get turned off by, I think is, you know, symptomatic of other things that maybe the filmmakers aren't uh, in control of. So grain of salt with all that. But, you know, I think getting overly complicated or overly ambitious I think is a thing I think you've got uh, trying to make a mini feature as the number one thing and I would agree wholeheartedly with that I think that finding a really clear simple idea is the essence of making a good short no matter what right and so being you know respectful of the format you know I think like 10 12 minutes is a real sweet spot I've seen great shorts that were four minutes long, five minutes long, and I think that it really serves everyone, the audience, most of all, but also like the filmmaker and the elements of production right? Uh, that, you know. Yeah, I think like if in, in an episode of TV, you would have like an A so- storyline and then a B and a C and maybe even a D, like in a short film, you pretty much should only have the A. Storyline, sure. right? And and look, if you can pull off a B storyline as well and they can dovetail and be really elegant, great. But it's just like the point of, of all storytelling is or all filmmaking, I think, the discipline comes in being able to drill down to what's essential and important and 
the most interesting and emotional and dramatic about your idea. So the more you can do that, the better. And frankly, that's a really important lesson that you'll have to relearn over and over again. Right. Well, I think there's this kind of like preconceived notion a lot of people have that like that there's this three act structure and a beginning, middle and end and twists and turns and the second act development, like all these things that they exist in features, they exist in TV shows, they exist in short films, they exist in scenes, right? You're a scene chef. And so when people hear that, they start trying to take their feature idea and make it into a short film. And there's like 20 scenes, you know, and there's like all these things and twists and turns. And so, yeah, it gets really complicated or it gets super rushed or it's super thin, right? Yeah. Um, because something's got to give. So that, yeah, that's a, that's, that I, I've seen that a lot of times and it's annoying. And I've been, that's probably the one I'm most guilty of mm-hmm. is like, I have a real hard time doing like one or two scenes, you know, I'm always like, Oh, sure. but then we need this scene. And then I, I have a tendency to like try to grow the world as much as possible. And mm-hmm. it always kind of makes things just feel too complicated and rushed. Well, I think you can hint at a world, right. And you can Im- imply a ton and you can be in the world, right. That that's all important and good. And, you know, makes a a good film great. But if we don't know who our hero is, what they want, and what's keeping them from getting it in the first 30 seconds, a minute, then you're in trouble, you know? And a feature, you get a little bit more time, but like, yeah, we're and talking a about feature, you get like four five minutes, minutes more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's something when you are showing someone a short, they are expecting it to be short. So, so yeah. So when, cause I've seen so many shorts where I'm like halfway through and I'm like, I don't know what the story is here. It's like two people in a bed. Remember we saw that one. It's like these, this couple in Syria and they were like under attack. Um, yeah. And it was like beautiful. And like the acting felt authentic and the, I'd never seen that re- like relationship and that place and that thing. But I was like so bored cause I didn't know where anything was going. Yeah. And, and look, and I, I didn't get- know what the stakes were. Sometimes your short film feels like the last opportunity to do, to do whatever the heck you want and you don't care what your professors say or what audiences say or whatever. But And I, I get that you have to follow your own you know, intuition and all of that. And also, like the rules of drama are pretty clear in terms of what engages an audience. And so s- sometimes you, <laughs> you want to spend uh, the privilege of like flopping you know, can be an important lesson. But uh, in the same way that hearing a a joke get laughs, you know, there were sometimes like something bombing, I think is is equally important. You know, it's funny, Oren, uh, you've noted uh, a couple drafts of a gray one from script all the way through the edit. And there's a specific joke that's like a, basically just like a very niche pop culture reference to like, Christmas Vacation, but does it's it's so niche that it doesn't actually even name check the movie. It just kind of describes a scene from the movie and names the actors. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty it's pretty oblique. You know, it's not like a very clear joke. And you weren't the only person who brought it up, but I think there's real value. And I was like, no, I I want this joke. I'm gonna do it. Like I took a ton of other people's notes, and I was just like, you know what? I want to do this. And literally every single person, and I flagged the joke and was like hey you know be sure you want to do this one and i was like yep i'm gonna be (laughs) stubborn on this one and uh you know it got some laughs but it's good to to know it's good to see that in front of an audience and see like ah like is this too niche am i okay with that and learning whether or not you're okay with that i think is important Uh, and i was it got like a couple laughs and I was like, perfect. That's the percentage I was planning on. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I'm all for doing stuff that people don't like in your short. That's why you're doing your short and not doing work for other people. Right. Cool. Well, so another thing I see all the time in short films and even feature films, but like more in shorts is people are trying to get so dramatic and so emotional, like right in the first scene, like the opening scene has somebody crying in it, has somebody like hurt, has somebody like their kid just died. They just found out they have cancer. They have like, and like a lot of times they're even like based on true stories or something or like they've just went through a horrible breakup or something. Um, they're 
girlfriend that they were about to ask to marry them got hit by a car, whatever, all that stuff. Like aside from it being like super cliche, something I learned on my first feature where I had an opening scene where this mom is crying. She finds out her son is deaf and she starts crying. And the editor told me, he's like, dude, no one is going to care about this woman crying because like nobody knows who she is. And I think like there's so many short films that start with people crying. And I just want you to know if you're making one of these shorts, like no one is going to care about a person crying. And on the contrary, they'll be like, dude, this is such a bummer. Why am I watching this? Like you need to hook people in with something either entertaining or truthful or unique Mm-hmm. or eye-opening before you're just like, oh, she left me. You know, like, I don't know. That's yeah. like my biggest pet peeve about shorts is that... I think that's the most direct you've ever been, <laughs> like the most prescriptive you've ever been on this show. It's uh, 190 episodes in. And I agree. I, th- I think, look, I understand where you're coming from. We just talked about how, like, keep it short, dive right in, do, you know, follow your voice, be yourself, all of that stuff. And that can all end up sounding like, a version of like, well, this is the biggest thing that happened to me and it is emotionally important and truthful and it is really raw and I really want to tell this story and this was the story I was born to tell and, you know, all of that. And so I I would say that, you know, pacing is going to be important in your short in a way that it works slightly different than a feature. And so I think you're right, Oren, you do need to give the audience some context for why they care before they can. Yeah, or unless you want to subvert the trope, unless you have, you start out, this woman is crying over a you know a tiny casket, and then someone's like, "Cut!" You know, whatever. Or she's like, "Sure, yeah, yeah." There, you cut wide, and she you goes to yeah. meet guys at funerals because they're sure. very vulnerable. Sure. Whatever, you know. Like, uh, I think you can subvert that, but it's just I don't know. It's one of my pet peeves. If you want to, yeah, definitely. You want to cry in your opening scene? Go for it. Go for it, sure. Jim Cummings. <laughs> um, well. It was just one scene, so technically that's true. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, next thing on my list. Sorry, I'm just hijacking this list. Do it. But this is it. a super obvious one that everyone's heard, but I'm just going to say it because I've seen it happen, is like the 14-minute the opening credits of like written, directed, edited, you know, all those things by the same person. Like, dude, get rid of all those credits. Hold on. I'll double down on that. Also, your closing credits are rough as well. And I would say that... I understand you want to make sure that you thank all of your Kickstarter backers or all of your classmates who worked really hard and, you know, shout out to your professor who gave really great notes, all that stuff. If you want to do that, I think you should. Special thanks. You should, one card. You should. We're out. No, no, no. Here's, here's my pitch, actually. Do a faster, leaner version for festivals. And if you want to do a friends and family screening or even like the... Uh, you know, the um, class screening or whatever, you can do the long credits for that version. Yeah. Or if but it's like, a comedy, play bloopers next to the credits. Sure, maybe. Give but I, frankly, I, I disagree, actually. I would say no one thinks. The only time bloopers are funny, truly, is when it's someone very, very famous that we all recognize who's embarrassing themselves. Like most of the time, bloopers aren't funny, and they're definitely not funny unless you have somebody genuinely famous in them. Again, yeah, friends and family screening, you're probably go right. for it. You're probably right. Go go right. for it if it, if everybody in the room knows those people, 100%. But like, well, if it's a movie about like parkour or something and it's like all the outtakes of like them falling and sure, breaking yeah. their face. If you've, if you've got a ton of great pratfalls, maybe. But the, the, the solid that you were giving to the entire uh, programming block... By keeping the pace up and keeping it economical and, and like just getting into the next film as soon as possible, that's like extra karma points and also keeps your runtime down, right? Like programmers are worried about how much time they have in their block. They want to get as many great short, uh, short films into that block as they possibly can. And sitting through, you know, 60 seconds of credits as things slowly roll by is brutal. Right. And also, Hollywood secret here, there's nothing more amateur than a Matt Enlow film written by Matt Enlow, directed by Matt Enlow, produced sure. by Matt Enlow, yeah. edited by Matt yeah. Enlow. Even if you yeah. only do, if it's written and directed, one card, that's fine. Mm-hmm. But don't don't even give us opening credits. I don't even need a title, to be honest, but I'll take a title if you feel like it is will help me understand the short better. Sure. Um, yeah. And if like, there is someone famous and you want to put their name, like the main cast, you can. But I, even that, I don't think you you should. 
I think it's, you know, we're calling them shorts for a reason. Like, be economical. Think of the audience. And this is all, again, practice for um, the big leagues. And so the more you think about and the more you sharpen these skills, the better off you're going to be on every other aspect of your career. Right. And this next note I have about things that are annoying about short films is kind of related to this, which is where you're just doing every shot is like a super shallow long lens depth of field, like shallow depth mm-hmm. of field shot that like shows that you used your Canon 5D or even your Alexa or whatever in like a super cinematic way. And I find a lot of times when you, there are extra long credits on the, the beginning of a short, it's because the director can't decide which shots, which cool insert shots of their environment they want to use. So they'll just like show 40 shots of this room and a bookshelf and a table and feet and whatever and put a bunch of credits next to them and they're 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 adding these opening credits so that they can have this like long ass montage of like shallow depth of field shots that are like not telling us that much not super good yeah yeah i this one is less of a thing for me but um but i think that's telling of our personalities yeah and i think it's kind of like a youtube thing too like, um, yeah. you know, if you come into filmmaking from the gear side, I think you see that a lot, you know? Yeah. I wonder also maybe if this speaks, to, I think there maybe is a new version of this. I think, or in your kind of, this is informed maybe by the like DSLR 5D revolution of like, oh, we can do soft focus now. Like we can have depth of field in a way that we couldn't back before those cameras were really readily available. And I wonder if now it's like, it's tropier to have like a flashy gimbal slash steady cam shot or like a drone shot or something like that. I bet there's other tropes that would drive you nuts. Right. If you like sat through a, a, a day of shorts. Yeah. Well, I just watched parasite, uh, and the open, and that's a feature film that can easily mm-hmm. take its time. Foreign film. It's on sure. the theater. I'm captive there. The opening shot is, uh, you see someone outside of a window, right? They they live in this like sub basement apartment. The main characters, and then we see the name of the movie, Parasite, and then the camera like booms down, and we get to one of our main characters, and he's like trying to get a Wi Fi signal on his phone. And it's like even in a movie that could take all the time at once, within the first minute, we like see this person's place in one shot. We see their problem. They don't have their own Wi Fi. They're trying to like steal a Wi Fi right. signal. We know so much and. Sure, they have. It some... belies everything you need to know about their problems already. Yeah, right? and like, this is a feature. Got... So oh, if if sure. a feature can introduce us to the world that fast, like why should a short take longer than that? You know, a hundred percent. So another thing, this is just amateurish filmmaking to me, but I've seen a lot in shorts is like no transitions, like just like a lot of medium and close up shots, and like you haven't quite thought how one scene ends and the next scene begins. Um, it's something that I find like especially when it's a filmmaker that is like coming from like an acting background or something. I feel like a lot of times the the coverage is just kind of boring. Basic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say that maybe some of these criticisms are just like bad filmmaking rather than short specific, but that shorts are where people get yeah. their start. Right. Yeah. If your short is about a time traveler that's trying to save their relationship because their girlfriend died uh, and they're trying to go back in time to save her. Like, just stop making that right now, please. <laughs> you know what? I've seen that short uh, many, many times. And a couple of times it was good. Yeah. yeah. There is like one or two good versions of it. Um, but yeah, I guess there is all those like kind of standard bad filmmaking things. Like if everyone in the movie is the same age as you and the same race as you. <laughs> um, and, yeah, it's sure. been, and it's shot in your apartment that has like no personality that's bad you know if the music feels just like thrown in there for no reason like if the comedy is like like also if things are soft if like you're making stuff that feels like it could be on abc or nbc or cbs then you should also not make that because you're not like like if if you're making something that's just not offending anyone i feel like it's also just like so (laughs) unnecessary (laughs) i think maybe i would tweak that slightly and say that yeah, there's a better way to a say short, it. A short film, is, yeah, because I, you know, I'm okay with not offending anyone. Um, but, you know, certainly my film is adult. It's not for everyone, right? Yeah, I mean, it's um, about a pube. Yeah, it's a pube joke. Yeah, yeah it's like a 10-minute pube joke. But I guess don't um, pull punches is what I mean. 
That is true. That is true. And uh, but I think that um, because people can tell when you're like, that's kind of funny, but it could have been really funny if you just went for it. You know, went for it. Well, but what I was going to say is that it, part of the reason you're making a short is so that you can you have you finally you have freedom, right? So why rein yourself in and do something that we've seen before um, when this is your shot to to really blow us away? And, you know, I think it's it's interesting. We haven't talked about this, I don't think. But I, so I submitted uh, a great one to Short of the Week and uh, didn't get in. And they sent me back really thoughtful feedback that, like, has really resonated with me. Did they recognize your name? Yeah, yeah. I emailed them and stuff. Okay. Yeah, that's the, the privilege of having a podcast and having relationships. But that's also a thing that you develop if you have been going to film festivals for a while, as you know the programmers. And so sometimes you they, you can... Say like, hey, you know, what'd you think? And they'll give you really thoughtful feedback. Ooh, and yeah, no, what did they say? So they really liked it, but that it, at a certain point, becomes a little rote, to put it bluntly. And like, they were more diplomatic than that. But basically, so just to give everyone context, the short, basically, the couple finds the pube and, uh, and it's really kind of like quick and punchy. And then at a certain point becomes just like a straight up, like you a know, Woody relationship talking drama. No, no, yeah. bound box. Sorry, I'll remove yeah, yeah, Woody yeah, Allen death, <laughs> exactly. And it's like there's like, yes, they're talking about a pube all the time, but most of the time they're really just talking about their feelings and the nature of growing old and all that. And they were like, yeah, that's even if that's emotionally true and uh, well performed and well written, we have seen it before, and. I got that feedback while I was still in Austin and like my first screening crushed. It did really, really, really well. It was like a, a like an ideal screening situation. You know, it was like a saw, like a saw the number of people, all the jokes landed, people were with me. And also Austin had done a good job of like setting things up so that like people were ready to laugh. There'd been a couple heavy films before mine. So it was like, right. they were primed. Everyone and was so, high. <laughs> yeah. But so what what struck me about it is that I think that programmers and critics are their job is not to necessarily find the films that an audience will like because an audience doesn't always have a problem with familiar, right? Like Hallmark movies, we, everybody knows exactly what's going to happen and the people love those things, right? But what their the, what their job is is to protect us from being bored, and and they're there to inject surprise so that we don't have to worry about it, right? So it's not about quality, right? Like every programmer will tell you they 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 don't get to program films that they love every single day, right? But the the nature of making sure that their programming is fresh so that people can don't don't have to think about it. I think is important, you know? Yeah. They're not going to give you vanilla, which is what everyone loves. Right. Everyone's yeah. People love vanilla. Favorite ice cream. And, they're going to give and, you avocado pistachio sure. sorbet. Yeah. And you're like, that's what I've never seen those you're two like, oh, together sure. before. And sometimes you're going to be like, I don't really love avocado sorbet, but, uh, but sometimes ideally you walk out and you're like, I had no idea. I love the avocado sorbet. Yeah. But then they can't serve it to you <laughs> the next block, you know? Right. Um, and yeah, so it was really, it was a, a really well-timed and interesting experience. Um, but so all of which is to say that, um, these short films are an opportunity for you to remind yourselves of, of those lessons and retool things and make them better and sharper because we are always in the studio system kind of getting inadvertently shoved towards what people think is going to appeal to an audience or what's familiar or what's safe. Right. Well, not to steal Scorsese's words, but if you're making a short, try to take a risk. And that risk yeah. could be being offensive. It could be, and I don't mean being offensive for the sake of being offensive. I mean, being offensive yeah, for mean... saying something that is truthful, but people are uncomfortable talking about it or something. Um, you mean bold. You mean raw. You don't mean hurtful. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, no, that, no, not hurtful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
but being a risk could also mean like telling the story in a weird structure, like starting in the middle and then going to the end and then the beginning, like whatever, like recasting your actors halfway through, doing crazy things, doing the whole thing split screen, vertical, whatever. Like sure. you, you have this medium and, and, that and you can maybe, mess around with. Maybe that means that you fail phenomenally. Yeah, no one gets it. And no one gets it. But that's the beauty of keeping things low risk, right? Or high risk. Or oh, you're saying low that risk in short, terms of like a short is in low terms risk. of yeah, in terms sh- of <laughs> making a short is low risk, which means you should go high risk with your exact concept. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's the kind sine cosine of it all. So this brings me to my final and by far the biggest thing I can ever say about shorts and all content, but mo- mostly about shorts because they are this wild you know, unexplored territory where you can do anything you want, which is like, don't try it. Like if your short feels like you've seen it before, then try to make something else, you know? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> like that, that's the thing. And that's, and that's I, the thing I, I've seen the most times where I've been to a film festival where it's like, this is a gangster short film. And it's like, I, you know, know what's going to happen. This is a sci-fi short film and I know what's going to happen. This is like, a bunch of hipsters having dinner and they're all going to want to have an orgy together, whatever. Like I've seen that so many times. And I know we've had a guest that made one, uh, a short like that, which which I did really enjoy. It's really good. Yeah. Um, But, but honestly, if that was the only short she made, I don't know. Like, I think it's part of her oeuvre or whatever, like her collection of work, it fits perfectly in there. Um, But if I'm in a shorts block and that's the short I see, I don't know. I, I feel like I've already seen it, you know? Right. Um, right. So just just try to make something that hasn't been made a million times. And that's Amen. why I haven't made a short. <laughs> <laughs> Can't think of anything original. Well, cool. So, so you made your short. Now, like, how do you judge whether it's successful or not? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that, um, you know, I think that, with anything going in with your own set of expectations and your own criteria is important. So setting your goals early is important, right? Like if I was like, I am only successful if this gets into Sundance, then I probably should have uh, thought through things differently, you know, but I wanted to just make something. The timing was right. Let's just go for it. Right. Um, Well, speaking of Sundance, do you think like it's important that your short has, like a message i think that there are clear trends with where what people are programming right now and like i would say sundance in particular has like a very clear maybe not explicit but probably you know like social commentary mandate you know that they really want to tackle intersectionality and you know and race and the politics of international topics also right Right. yeah definitely yeah and i would say that if there is a specific festival where you're like ah this is the one that i really think speaks to my voice and speaks to who i am and and would be meaningful for my career you know watch what they're programming and and you don't need to be careerist or try to like deconstruct everything about it but i think like there are going to be commonalities of like production value cast etc that i think you'll have to take into consideration. Um, And so, you know, I was clear with myself that I wanted to go to a a specific tier of festival. And I think Austin has probably, you know, the exact thing I was hoping for. Um, And so, but as a result, I didn't apply to as many festivals as I could have. Certainly Film Freeway makes it easy. You know, you can just click the box and spend the money and then there you go. But like, we we will have played three festivals and then we'll do an online premiere and that'll be that, um, which is a much shorter run than KIA, for instance. Right, you're the previous um, short. Correct, yeah. Um, but so, but that's okay. That's not what I wanted. I wanted to be able to send something that I liked around town. So is that? So are you happy that you made this short? Yeah. And would you yeah, have definitely. done anything differently given? Um, I guess, given the feedback you got from the short of the week guys. Yeah. You know, I think, I think that 
the beauty of deciding to stay on that treadmill means that I'm I don't know that I would change much. There's maybe a few things I would tweak here and there, but it's more that like I'm just so grateful to have that lesson again so clearly articulated, you know? Um because which lesson? Just that, you know, to kind of keep keep them guessing, you know, mm-hmm. like that I had done a good job in the first third of surprising people and like coming at a very familiar problem of like two well-to-do people coming to terms with their aging and what it means to their relationship. That's well-worn territory. Right. Um, and so the, the challenge was how can I make a stupid joke of that and also have it be emotionally authentic. And I think that that's a thing that I've you constantly have to just work on. You know, and so I'm taking all of those lessons into my next short film, but because I'm already working on that next one, um, I'm grateful for all of those mistakes. And it's not as as cataclysmic. It's not like, oh my God, well, this was my one shot. You know, right. you can just kind of keep making and keep collaborating and improve. And so I think that's the big thing is like, if you can make some, if you can find a way to stay on that treadmill and stay it keeps you creatively fulfilled it keeps you engaged you can still make money plenty of other ways and you still have something to talk about to all of your peers um so that's really the success is just like continuing to make i think is really valuable and do you find that you are talking about it to your peers uh well i'm talking about it on a podcast (laughs) um yeah yeah i would say so i think that like you know People are aware of it thanks to posting about it on social media and going to Austin and like posting the trailer and things like that. I think it'll be a different deal when um, th- it premieres online, you know. Um, but I am really grateful that I cut like a fun, clean thirty-second trailer. So you made so you made this short, and you also made a trailer, so you can kind of share it with people. Yeah, and then you post some social media photos of yourself at the festival, um, and that's all a way of saying like, Hey, I'm making things. Remember me without having to like email a producer and say, Hey, like I'm free right now. You know, it's another version of the thing we always talk about of like the check-in, the heartbeat of like, this is what's interesting. Right. And, uh, what I'm doing, you know? So that, that was my goal. And because it was like fun and fulfilling and not that expensive, it's an easy win. So did you email any producers and say, hey, I'm in a short, I'm just playing in Austin, just uh, I, I wanted to say hi and show you this. I one. will once the film is live. I w- I'm hoping that I can get like, and we can get into distribution now, mm-hmm. uh, get into the, the staff pick territory. So basically, so my strategy is that, you know, I did the film festival thing, like we said, I was very selective. I only wanted like festivals that I wanted to go to or that would be really meaningful to my career. And so we did that. Um, Lone Star is still coming up, but like it's Lone Star, um, Austin, and Sidewalk were the three that we got into. Where's um, Lone but Star? Then at, is that in Texas Lone, too? Lone Star's in Texas as well, yeah. Yeah, and that's uh, what we know the programmers through KIA. And I'm so bummed that we couldn't get to go. But like the those people are also, their sister festival, Hill Country, is really wonderful. And it's where I met the Delt guys, actually. Oh, cool. Or no, where I saw Delt, but I don't think I met them yet. Um, but yeah, so like, you know, you get to know great festivals and want to be a part of them and all that stuff. So we did that. Um, and then, like I said, we were good about posting on social media. And so people are aware of the film and, you know, our friends are, are, are keeping tabs on things. And, you know, there's there's a general elevated awareness of the film right Mm -hmm. next we're submitting to online festivals so that's kind of a newer thing but like you've got like a short of the week type of thing short of the week is the you know a marquee one but no budge director's note there's a couple others out there they're all still submittable through um film freeway through film freeway yeah but like finding a good place to premiere is also really helpful and then 
day and date as it premieres, I'll promote that across social media and get everybody to really kind of like um, spike that in hopes that it gets a Vimeo staff pick. Thereafter, whether it gets the staff pick or not, I'll be able to reach out to people and say like, hey, my short's now online. I'd love for you to check it out. It's really short. And it played these places and it, I'm so proud of it. And let's get coffee, everyone. So is that so the that move? Like, be, check out my short and let's get coffee? Uh, I think so. Or maybe just, hey, check out my short. And then if people write back and said they liked it, then maybe we reconnect, you know? But, um, Oren, you're the, the the person who always says, you know, you have to update people with new news. Like, just <laughs> checking in doesn't mean anything, right? Well, that's what so I this, thought until we interviewed Natalie Metzger last week. Well, but... And then she, she changed, said, she uh, rocked my world when it came to that. Well, you can say... Hey, congrats also, but that's a version of that's new news. That's just their news. It's not your news. Right. So if you're trying to self generate reaching out to people, this feels like a nice way to do it. Yeah. No, for sure. It's a good way to do it. Um Yeah, no, I, I would do it. I mean, I'm having my own issues right now about like I you know, figuring out what to send people you know i have a lot of 30 second commercials but i don't know about you You, i feel like you're a little different than me i look at all my work and i'm like ah i just like i wish every shot was a little different i wish the editing was a little different. i wish the mix was a little different i wish the color was a little different i wish the vfx were a little different and so it's really hard for me to look at like a shot i've actually shot a lot of stuff in 2019 and i want to send like three things you know and I don't know which three things are going to resonate. Like I shot some vlog stuff for Disney that I think is like the lowest of the levels of work that I've done. You know, it's like a vlog, but I think it looks really good. And it might be to a person who's like, I mean, all, we all know nowadays, like a branded one by one vlog for Instagram might be like something that somebody is, is, is looking for a director for. So I'm, yeah. I'm having a really hard time figuring out what to show people and i guess like in terms of your short like i just went to your website right now like you have this amazing video with barack obama you have like this awesome trailer to we are cvnt5 like townies like this allison williams thing awkward at parties like you have all these things that are great at the top of your pod of your website like where does a gray one your short film go on your website like how much how much does that define you versus like some of your older work? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, I think that uh, we are butting up against our websites serving a few too many masters. And so I think it will be somewhere in the middle. But I think that I think that a website is mostly there for work for hire and that it's really more of a portal to get commercial work than anything else i think and that if someone is reaching out or is interested in you for more episodic or serialized or scripted work that typically that means that you're sending them links or that they've heard through the grapevine of your work i don't know that that's totally true maybe i go back and forth because i would love to just be drumming up exclusively episodics right now um but i love commercials as well and so it's this weird combination of like what do you lead with on your website because there's only one top of your page you know right well i guess i think the sum of its parts is only as good as each part you know and so if there's like a bad part in the second shot i'm like are people off or if it's like too fast like i'm really i'm really like wondering about like whether people are getting the idea you know mm-hmm. and, and yeah. it's a lot of it is coming from my uh lack of focus when i watch things i'm like oh, i can't sure. even pay attention to something for more than one second nowadays yeah, yeah, yeah. and so yeah. can people pay attention to the stuff that i'm making or do i have to be even clearer but um but yeah if i would have made a short like because like clearly you look at your subaru thing you look at barack obama you look at awkward at parties um you know any of like these great spots you have here like they have much bigger budgets and potentially like more famous people than your short. And so mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, 
it's, I guess really the answer is that like where it lives on my website is separate from what I think is the most valuable aspect of it. Like really it's the, it's the outreach that I get to do as a result of it. You know, I mean, I think that Obama one is like a really perfect example of like the, the war that we all have internally about what to put where, because like it's two shots Mm-hmm. And like my I Harrison Ford one, yeah, I would have lit it differently. And like the director's cut is funnier than what ended up getting put out there because of a ton of different reasons. And so I see, I when I look at that piece, I think of like all the different things that I would have done. And also, Barack Obama is in it. Yeah. So it's like, what what's more valuable? You know, like a a genuinely good video that like raised voter awareness and starred the ex president, our most recent previous president. You know, like that's pretty neat. But also, like, does it show me off as a filmmaker? You know, only to a certain extent. Yeah, I guess the thing about a gray one that's awesome is that you wrote it. You know, yeah, which is probably not true about so many other things. Sure, on the site, and also it the first few beats of it are pretty cool you know like there's like a that first scene is like a little typical you know um but like pretty quickly it goes a little bonkers you know and so that's fun as well but more importantly i think it it just shows off this point of view that i'm trying to cultivate right like i want to do emotionally resonant you know interpersonal human stories where I also have a heightened element of some sort, whether that's genre or just more style, but like, you know, taking two people and and having them talk in a small apartment could be very boring visually. And I like threw a lot of spaghetti at the wall to make it interesting. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, yeah. Keep, keep us updated as to how, like what it leads to. I mean, I, I think like, I know that the answer is whether it leads to everything you ever wanted or nothing, it doesn't, it's still, the act of making it is, like, actually, like, the most important part. And also, I don't think it'll be conclusive. I, it's very rare that someone's like, oh, I saw this thing, and you got the job because of it. Yeah, you know? we've heard that story many times on the podcast. I feel like I made this short, and I, I sure. mean, like, Thunder Road is yeah. obviously a great yeah, example, yeah. but... um. I'm sure we've heard of people making shorts that basically got them the feature mm-hmm. job. Certainly. Certainly, yeah, that's true. Um but yeah. Oh, I, I mean think Sam it's worth it to... um Zwiebelman is like the perfect example, right? He made like these proof of concept trailers. Yeah, but I I guess I don't want to confuse a proof of concept with a short and a short film. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the th- Runtime is the thing they have in common, but like a proof of concept is more like a rip a matic or a sizzle or something like that than it is necessarily a, a standalone film, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, shorts. I got to make one. Yeah. You got to get script. Um, I mean, for me. I would write you a script, I think. <laughs> Why? I don't know. It's fun to see something made. I, it, I was, the, the hesitation in my voice is like, oh, would I be would I be able to not be a fucking monster about it and not like would I just want to tell you how to do your job? Yeah, I wouldn't mind that. I mean, I've tried to co-direct <laughs> things with you a million times. One time, one time. Well, one time it got really close. We got close. Yeah, yeah. We'll figure it out. Maybe I'll write a, uh, write us something soon. Well, cool. Well, uh, we'd love to hear your stories about your shorts and your things. Feel free to send us your shorts. Um, yeah, please. Matt will probably ignore your email. I'll watch it and send you a lot of really annoying notes about crossing hold the on, line. Hold on, this is a. I want to just say to the listeners, this is. It's been a clear delineation of responsibilities. Oren responds to the emails. <laughs> I'll chime in every once in a while, but for the most part, it's Oren's job. And I post the episodes and all of the other stuff. Yeah, it's like no. the clearest split no, in terms obviously. of what we do. Yeah, but but, but so but also, I want people to know I believe I'm not being rude. No, 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 you're not. <laughs> but my notes are probably more annoying than Matt's notes. Um, but speaking of which, if Kyle Fossey, if you're listening to this uh, podcast, I did get your email a couple months ago about giving you notes on your reel. 
It's a minute and six seconds, so you know I haven't quite had the time to watch it yet. But right as soon as we're done recording this podcast, I'm going to watch it and I'm going to send you annoying notes about what shots I think aren't good enough. All right. Well, stay tuned for that, Kyle. Yeah. If you want notes, <laughs> I, I have zero experience in uh, having my shorts at Sundance or anything, but I'm happy to give notes. <laughs> um, Inexperienced and opinionated. Yes. Just shoot it. Well, cool. Should we uh, should we do unpaid endorsements? Yeah, yeah, of course. Unpaid endorsements. Okay, I got a really bad one. Hit me. What you got? As usual. Okay, well, I'm going to give a bunch of them because they're all bad. So one, I've been trying to buy a new backpack. I talked to you about it the other day. You bought the... Did you decide on one? The Bellroy uh, oh, Laptop yeah. Classic Plus bag. It is slick, you guys. I got uh, an e-bags one that I like very much, but is um, not as cool looking as this Bellroy. This Bellroy looks cool. But I do think I've been, I almost like have been trying to convince myself that it's okay to own like a few different backpacks. Your backpack, and this is, might hurt your heart a little bit, but it just went on a crazy sale. It's like, oh, really? Oh, man. It's like Get it. 60 bucks now or something. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I got it on sale um, when I got it, but I think I spent I think it's like a hundred dollar backpack or something. Um, this one was way too expensive and it's missing some really, like, I guess part of their thing is like, they're real simple. These Bellroy mm-hmm. backpacks, supposedly they last forever and they're like waterproof. They're, it's, uh, it looks great. It's like a great stylish backpack. I did not want to get like a black, like kind of Silicon Valley techie type backpack, which is basically the backpack that I have, which is and- like every backpack. Except for yeah, this yeah. or a Herschel backpack, which will fall apart in like two months. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's like maybe a little basic. The Herschel ones? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They look, I mean, they look so good. But yeah, they, we've, I've had two Herschel backpacks that literally we like wear like around, like we travel for two weeks with and they fall apart. Yeah, you're, um, you're great. But, uh, but when I was telling my friend Avi about how I was looking for a new backpack, he was like, dude, you know, I'm like a bad guy. I was like, no, I didn't even know. There are bad guys like, no, I like go to carryology.com like every day. And so, <laughs> so that's my first endorsement. If you want to get into something because you're bored with your life and you want to get into like cool backpacks, travel packs, like different luggage things, like ways to organize your gear, your laptop and your dongles and all that stuff, carryology.com. It's kind of uh, an interesting website that I've just kind of been obsessed with. Even though I already bought this backpack, now I'm like, Hey, maybe I should have You're like still a, an everyday backpack and a travel backpack. I didn't even know an everyday backpack is a term, but I guess it's like a very sure. common term. Yeah. Yeah. Or like, um, like a day hike backpack, like a simple backpack. Yeah, they, there's yeah. literally a f- backpack called the festival backpack that you would wear to like Coachella. Oh God. I know. Kill me. I know. Um, well, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I am pro backpack in general and I like mine is basically like my office, but on the go. So it's got, a compartment for literally anything I could possibly want to put in there. Yeah, that um, yours is really cool. It was on my finalist list, but um, you actually convinced me not to buy it. It looks a little dorky. Yeah, it looks a little dorky. And so um, I think as directors, there is a little bit of like, you kind of need to look cool sometimes, you know? There are a few, there's only a few opportunities. So like cool shoes, cool backpack, cool jacket. Yeah. You know, cool. those are opportunities for a little flair. Yeah. Cool AirPod Pros. I did not buy them yet because I just bought the freaking AirPods. Now I'm like mm-hmm. in a real dilemma. Yeah. But the other thing, and this is something that I've has literally been driving me crazy for like 15 years. It's a Photoshop thing. If I, I have like five documents open and let's say I want to put a logo at the bottom right of the document. I position it exactly where I want it. Then I want to copy it to all the other five documents and I want it to be in the exact same position because if it's on a web page or something I want them to I want it to be in the exact right place and I don't want to eyeball it on each page so the way usually you would take like one layer from one document to another layer to another document is you would like drag it you click on it in the layers menu and drag it to the document tab and then drop it there but it just like it is so dumb it it drops it wherever your mouse is it doesn't drop it in the same place I found out how to do it and i'm sure so many of you out there that use photoshop already know this but for me who uses photoshop like on a weekly basis i did not know about this um if you right click on a layer or on a group so let's say you want to copy five layers over because you have like a logo and like a starburst and the shadows or whatever um 
you can group the, those layers and you right click on the group and you say duplicate group. And then it actually asks you if you want to duplicate that group in that document or you can hit a drop down menu and choose any document oh. you want it to go to. And whichever document you choose, it'll show up in the exact same position as long as it's the That's same nice. document dimensions. That's pretty nice. You can also do the drag thing. And if you, I think if you hold down shift, or there's a hotkey, uh, okay. it'll land in the same place. But it's like that makes the sense. duplicate thing works so well. I, read, I made, made this new page on my website where I have like the logos of each company mm, on the thumbnails. Nice. And it like saved me. Um, so right click, duplicate, and then choose which document you want to copy it to. We'll copy an element from one Photoshop document to another and have it end up in the same place. Seems so simple, but uh, kind of complicated. <laughs> Anyhow, those are my endorsements. What do you got? Um, the movie Upgrade is my endorsement. Oh. <laughs> it's on. Uh, it is currently on HBO. Is what I okay. mean to say. So it's on. Um, what? What's a uh, HBO Go? HBO Go. Yeah, it's on HBO Go and what I assume whatever their other Max uh, non a la carte um, option is. But it's on HBO basically, and it's great. It's like so, it's a. A little violent here and there, pretty violent here and there, but it's like cool visually. It's surprisingly funny. Um, the plot is like the premise is a little thin, but it knows it and it's fine. I, I'm so surprised. I had a great time watching it. I could be wrong about this, but I think this is the first time you've ever endorsed something that I have previously endorsed. Oh, is that true? Well, that's why I think I could be wrong, but I, I've for sure talked about this movie because way before I saw it, I saw the trailer and it like blew my mind. Oh, I haven't even seen the trailer. I should watch it. Oh, it's like, are you, I feel like for sure I showed you this trailer. Um, when it came, I mean, it came out like two years ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, cause well, in the yeah, trailer, there's all these amazing shots where the camera is locked to the actor. Mm-hmm. Right. And these insane action scenes. I mean, the, have you looked into how they did that? I saw some behind the scenes, but I think it's all in post. They, yeah, I think I, I assume they just the like, camera. Yeah. yeah, but they might be shooting like six K or something. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's like extra just wide, big six K pieces, and then kind of doing all the moves. But, but yeah, it was cool. But super cool. Like if the movie gives you like a like a B plus feeling, like watching the trailer will give you a, like a B. Like you almost get all that you need from the movie mm. by watching the trailer the trailer is sure. so good and the movie is like is a long version of the trailer <laughs> cool man well that was great yeah if you all have any questions please send us an email at just shoot a pod at gmail.com we'll have show notes at just shoot a pod.com and uh we'd love to hear from you leave us a voicemail one six two six shoot one uh is how you call us and then we'll play your voice and It'll just be like really fun. Uh, iTunes reviews are great. This episode was edited by Jonathan Luna. And our webmaster is Ewan Williams. The music you're listening to is from the Free Music Archive and the artist Jazard. And if you want to find us on social media, we're at Just Shoot It Pod across everything. I'm on Instagram at O Kaplan. And I'm at Mr. Matt Enlow on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the things. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks, everyone. We'll catch you next time.